Woo! Amen. Amen. Wow. Dude, you, you guys totally crushed that song, man. Wow. What's up, RCBC? Hey, let, let me just... So I can put this stupid sign down, but so RCBC recycles, right? We have our, our thrift shop, not a thrift store, remember. We're a biker church, so we got to have a, a thrift shop. Normal churches that have thrift stores, we got a shop. So anyways, it's going to be opening up hopefully um, one January-ish, right? Maybe, maybe that week, of the first week of January. And um, we're going to be out at the swap meet tomorrow. So if you have donations and you want to donate, we will be more than happy to take them off your hands tomorrow at the swap meet. If not, just let me know. And uh, we've been stashing some stuff over in the office. And once the swap meet's over with, once the, once the swap meet's over, we can start putting stuff in the truck until the fire inspector comes through and, and takes care of business. So anyways... And uh, I put some of these cards. So we have some out there at the front door. And if you're new here, if you're new at RCBC, do me a favor, before you leave, we have markers out there in a little bowl. Please sign our wall. Yes, yes, please. But anyways, I have these out there and I also put them on the table. If you could do me a favor and take them, with you and carry them around and somebody says hey you guys know of a cool church to go to be like absolutely i just happen to have one of these cards here you go or if they say hey do you know a place where i could get used hardy parts you can be like i just happen to have a card right here and then you can give it to them all right so anyways somebody take them sticks away from marcus please and give them back to him question in the front row <laughs> Indigenous personnel, motorcycle parts. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, anyways, maybe we'll have some. But hey, um, yes, you got me all off track. So hey, look, there's no front row here anymore. Nobody ever sits in the front row except Jerron, right? And I'm just like, all right, man. So we took the front row away, right? Moved all the tables forward, and we put these killer tables back here. And um, so, Rex, where you at, man? Thank you. If you ever bought anything from Ikea, oh, my God. Like, there's a ton of parts that you have to put together, and you need an engineering degree. And anyways, but, Rex, I appreciate you helping me on that one, man. So, swap me uh, Bible study. So, we had the ladies' Bible study on Wednesday, 7 o'clock, regular time. Thursday's the general Bible study, 7 o'clock regular time right here. And then Saturday is the big day, right? So Saturday, we want to meet here at 1130. And then we're going to ride over as a group um, to the Volusia Memorial Gar uh, Cemetery. And we're going to link up with the group called Wreaths Across America. And I think what they're going to do is give us a quick class on how to identify a veteran's grave marker. And that way we can understand and identify. And then we're going to assist with putting the, the wreaths at all the gravestones that belong to veterans in that cemetery. They said it could take right around an hour, depending on how many, vet or how many um, volunteers they have. So anyway, stay tuned on that one, but remain flexible. And then if you don't want to meet here and you just want to go there, just Google the Volusia Memorial Park. Volusia Memorial Park. It's like 550 uh, Nova, and uh, it's right there in Ormond Beach. But anyways, it should be a really cool event to do. I've actually never done anything like that before, so I think that's a, a first. Um, check it off the bucket list. And then we have RCBC's Dinner. Right, so RCBC's dinner is next Saturday from four to six. It's completely catered. The leadership, Jim, Helen, Frankie, and I um, talked it over, and we said, you know, we don't want anybody going out of the way to, to make this happen. It's not a potluck, okay? We're gonna cater the event. We're gonna have meatloaf. We're gonna have uh, grilled chicken, 
and um, you know some vegetables and some desserts and stuff like that, and then of course coffee and drinks and stuff like that. But it's from four to six, and then we have a very special treat, right? Because not that Brian and his band isn't a special treat, but Sparrow Ministry is coming and they're going to do a bunch of Christmas songs, right? And it was actually Brian's brainchild, but the schedules just can't line up. But Saturday, uh, we're going to do um, Christmas carols. Uh, Frankie's got an amazing message. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that, and um, it, it, there's going to be some cool things all lined up through the night, you know. So anyways, the 18th of December, uh, a lot of things going on. So if you have any questions, just come and ask me, and um, I'll be able to let you know. Um, so Saturday, church, special stuff going on. Um, yeah, that's about it. And then that will be our last church service until New Year's Day, which comes on a Saturday. And then that'll be the next uh, church service will be January 1st. So. Frank, who gave Frankie caffeine? <laughs> so, anyways, uh, that concludes my announcements. If you have any questions, just please feel free to uh, um, ask me afterwards. So, with that said, do me solid. Look to your left, right, front, and back. Give your neighbor a howdy, a head nod, a handshake, a fist bump. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. We're glad you guys are here. Love y'all.
Michael is no longer in charge of the intro music. That was horrible. Well, good evening, everybody. How we doing? That was supposed to be thunderstruck, just so you know. So what do y'all think of my shepherd's crook, huh? You, you sit in the back. Helen gave it to me. I thought it was pretty neat. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. One, um, one announcement we forgot is the Iron Horse uh, is the 19th, the 19th. So we're going to be out at the Iron Horse at 10. And uh, one other thing I wanted to say, you know, this place doesn't work without Bobby C. All right? Seriously, y'all, give it up. He, uh, he got all the catering ordered. He got the tables. You know, I got the easy part. You know, come up here and teach. But, uh, Bobby, really appreciate all you do, brother. And uh, even though you're Army. But anyway, let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and open up service with uh, prayer to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for all you do in our lives. I pray that you would come down here right now and be amongst us. Lord, indwell us with your Holy Spirit. Teach us what you'd have us to learn. Help us take it away from here different than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Jack walked into a sports bar around 9.58 p.m. He sat down next to a guy at the bar who had obviously had too much to drink. They both stared at the TV as the 10 o'clock news came on, and the news crew was covering a story of a man on the ledge of a large building that was preparing to jump. The drunk guy looked at Jack and said, you think you'll jump? Jack said, you know what, I believe you will. The drunk guy replied, well, I bet he won't. Jack placed 50 bucks on the bar and said, you're on. Just as the drunk man placed his money on the bar, the guy in the ludge took a swan dive off the building, falling to his death. The drunk man was really upset. He handed him the $50 to Jack and said, fair is fair. Here's your money. Jack replied, I can't take your money. I saw this earlier on the 5 o'clock news, and I knew he'd jump. The drunk man replied, I did too, but I didn't think he'd do it again. That was bad. That was bad, wasn't it? All right. A teacher told her sixth grade class to ask their parents for a family story with a moral at the end of it and to return the next day to tell their stories to the class. In the classroom the next day, Joey gave his example first. My dad is a farmer, and we have chickens. One day... We were taking lots of eggs to market in a basket in the front seat of the truck is where we put the basket. We hit a bump in the road and the basket fell off the seat and all the eggs broke. The moral of the story is not to put all your eggs in one basket. Very good, said the teacher. Next, Mary said, we are farmers too. We had 20 eggs waiting to hatch, but when they hatched, we only got 10 chicks. The moral of this story is not to count your chickens before they're hatched. Very good, said the teacher. Very pleased with the responses so far. Next, it was Dave's turn to tell his story. My dad told me this story about my Aunt Karen. Aunt Karen was a flight engineer in the war, and her plane got hit. She had to bail out over enemy territory and all she had was a bottle of whiskey, a machine gun, and a machete. Go on, said the teacher. Aunt Karen drank the whiskey on the way down to prepare herself. She landed right in the middle of 100 enemy soldiers. She killed 70 of them with the machine gun until she ran out of bullets. Then she killed 20 more with the machete until the blade broke. She killed the last 10 with her bare hands. Good heavens, said the horrified teacher. What does your father say the moral of the story was? Stay away from Aunt Karen when she's been drinking. Now, 
I don't know if you've noticed anything different about me today, but a few things have changed, okay? Now, I don't know if y'all follow motorcycles at all. Oh, how'd that get up there? Wow. Well, since somebody obviously put this slide up there, I should probably talk about the new Indian that I got. Now, I'm going to get to that, okay? Now, those of you that have known me for a while are not surprised by this at all, amen? See, there you go. Um, I had the other one almost six months, so, you know, it was easier to trade it in than get an oil change. So, um, you know, something I want to mention before we get started is I think we're getting a little too politically correct at our church, okay? You may not realize it, but it's starting to affect things. The day after I bought this bike, I got a text from Bobby and Timmy demanding that I immediately change the name of my motorcycle from Indian motorcycle to indigenous people's motorcycle. And I just think that's a little ridiculous, don't you? Amen? No? Fine. All right, so last week we finished up our series called What Truly Matters. Some of you are praising God right now that we finally got into the lesson. What do you guys think of our series? Yeah? Did you learn anything? If not, don't tell me, because it'll make me feel bad. So, if you were here last time we did a pancake breakfast, I'm sorry, but you're going to hear some of the same stuff that I talked about then. Because Bobby and Jen thought it was something that everyone would like to hear and suggested that I teach it again for regular service. And before we start tonight's lesson, I want you to know it's not, it's not real spiritually deep. So if you were coming expecting like some, some thick stuff from apologetics or some hermeneutics, I'm going to tell you, go online and look it up because it ain't going to happen tonight, all right? But it's definitely critical for living as a Christian in today's world. So I think you'll still get something out of it. So since it's easy to get the point of the message, I figured we'd have a little fun. What do you guys think? You good with that? Yeah? All right, good. Huh? You got a what? Thank you. That ain't, this is not part of the service. All right, good. Thanks. All right. So here's the deal. Before we get started, I want to talk to you about something that I don't know a lot about, okay? Building motorcycles. That's why I traded in. When it starts to break, I get a new one, okay? I, I don't know anything about building motorcycles. But it really can't be that hard, right? Anybody? It can't be that hard. And, and I was thinking... If I was to take Bobby's custom Triumpho here, right, and, and I pulled the motor out of it, you guys down with that? We'll pull the motor out of it tonight? You good with that? I think, um, I think we could do it. What do you guys think? Yeah? Nobody asked you, right? What do you, let me ask you, what do we need to pull that motor? Guts, that's the first thing, right? What else? What else do we need? Tools? Who said tools? Yeah, I think we need some tools, right? Good, because I brought some tools. All right, I brought some tools. So let me, I'll tell you what, we'll pull out some tools and we'll get started. So um, we'll get that. I figure, uh, I figure that'll work, right? That, um, this, is, this is a good tool right there. All right, good, yeah, scraper. Right. I figure, yeah, we, we should be good with these, right? I mean, that's tools. Yeah? What do you think? We can pull it, right? We ready? Who's going to help me? What do you mean, no? What? Wrong tools? Says who? You said I needed tools. You didn't say specific tools. I brought tools. The right tools. Man. You guys are so demanding. 
So, so you don't think this is going to help me pull the engine? Cut the cables? No? All right. Yeah? That, okay. I figure this, this might work on the Indian, right? Amen? Anybody? I, I just came up with that one. All right. Of course, of course I'm being silly, right? There's people here tonight going, man, we came here as a visitor, right? Of course these tools are not going to work for pulling the motor. So the understanding is that not only do we have to have tools, but we have to have the right tools, right? Right? And obviously these aren't the right tools. Not for that job anyway, right? So we'll put those aside. All right. So tonight, I want to talk about how we live our lives and determine whether or not we've been using the right tools for living, okay? Because if we're honest with ourselves, where do we look when we're trying to find advice and information about how to live our lives? Where do we look? Next slide. Come on. Where do we look? Television? The internet? Yeah, what did we do without the internet, right? What did we do without Amazon, y'all? I mean, come on. We get it from newspapers, the latest polls, the media, right? That, I mean, honestly, that's where we get our news. I want you to listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Now listen, the Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy approximately 1,957 years ago. And he was predicting the future, okay? Listen again. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers, Kardashians, who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after these myths. We're there, you guys. We are there. Do we see the internet, the media, and the other tools that we have for living as what they really are of the world? Or do we look at them as real tools for living? Do we consider them as places where we can find truth? Places that we can find true authority? I'm going to tell you, most people do. Most people do. But as Christians, our lives should be under the authority of this book. Okay? Our lives should be under the authority of this book. But people say, man, it's an old book. It's a bunch of old stories written by a bunch of old men. Right? The question is, do we honestly look at the Bible as a tool for living or something that's nice to read when we have time? That's the question. You see, in order to allow Scripture to be a tool in our lives, we have to use it. We have to use it. And after using it, we can start to have faith in what it says. And just like we use a torque wrench or a lift, to bring up a bike, we have faith that they're going to work for the job that we have to do. And we got that faith, how? From using them before, right? Anybody? You see, the more we use our tools, the more we have faith that they're going to be what we need for the job that we have. 
And the more we use Scripture as a tool, the more we're going to trust that it will work for the problems that we encounter every day. As Christians, our main tool for living should be this book. But instead of using Scripture, we use all kinds of other things. I mean, that's the truth. We try to use logic. I love logic. We're going to talk about logic. See, I don't know if you know this or not, but logic is not always correct. Did you know that? Let me give you an example. Let's say if I were to look someone in traffic and give them the middle finger, okay? Now, they might get angry, okay? They might get angry. Bet you never thought you'd see that in church, would you? Okay. But logic will tell you that that's not going to hurt them, right? There's nothing about showing somebody my middle finger that's harmful. No different than if I were showing them my thumb, right? But listen, folks, I guarantee you that if you try this tonight on your way home, you'll get a reaction. But listen, if they respond negatively, I want you to tell them you're being illogical. Okay? You're being illogical. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. But that's what we do. We try to use logic. Instead of logic, we try to use the world's rationale. An example of uh, one of the world's rationale is the ends justifies the means. The ends justifies the means. All of us in here know about that, right? I'm going to tell you folks, it's not true. But we hear people say it all the time. We read stories all the time about crooked cops that trick someone into admitting guilt, right? Because they believe that that person was guilty. And they sit back and they go, well, the ends justifies the means. No, it doesn't. Just because they got a conviction of an innocent person to close the case doesn't mean that justice was served. In fact, they created a much worse situation by putting an innocent person in jail while the real criminal, Bobby, goes free. Did I say what? Sometimes we justify our actions based off the world's rationale, right? So if logic isn't going to work and the world's rationale is it going to work? Well, then maybe, maybe we can base our actions off of what everyone else is doing, right? What the majority is doing. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it's definitely the wrong tool to use. Let me give you an example. That was the 90s. Everybody had hair like that. There was a time, hold on, ladies, you know you was you. You're not fooling anybody. There's women right now going, I don't know what he's talking about. Right? There was a time when people thought that looked good. Okay? There was a time when people wore those clothes. They paid money for those clothes. Some of you have that outfit at home. Right? Right? Are you kidding me? And we thought we looked cool, man. Right? Anybody? No? I think we can all agree now that was the wrong tool, amen? Unless you're blind. Anyway, most people, most people tend to use those tools. And sometimes, sometimes... We use modern tools. I'm gonna, we're going to refer to it as modern tools to justify things or to explain things. Let me give you an example. The common theory or tool to explain how we got here is called evolution. I'm not even going to go into that. We're just, you know we have a problem with that. All right. Next, our laws are what we use to guide how we should live. Right? 
but they change every day. Anybody? Do you know in some states they're about to overturn Roe versus Wade? Hey, you guys that are from the 60s, did you know that marijuana is legal in a lot of places? Why are you living in Florida, bro? Right? They change every day. Listen, our public schools are the tool that we use to teach our children what they need to know. How's that working out for you? Hey, buddy? Look, I'm not saying I could do it better, but it ain't too good right now, all right? A lot of people in our generations choose not to use the Bible as a tool for living. They choose not to use it. Some of them choose to ignore it because they don't believe it has any authority. They don't believe it has any authority. Or because they just don't know how to use it. Okay, some people believe it has authority, but they don't know how to use it. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So in order, you know, people might ask me, Frankie, how can our knowledge of the Bible be used as a tool? Right? Somebody might ask me that, right? Right? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Gene. Debbie, you failed. You failed. All right, listen. Matthew, <laughs> listen. In order to use what is in the Bible effectively, we have to know how to use it. We have to understand how to use its passages as a tool. Same way we would use a tape measure or a hammer. Okay, but how do we do that? Matthew 4, Matthew 4, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read some scripture to you. I'm going to show you a great example of how to use scripture. Then Jesus, you guys know who that is, right? Christmas thing, all right. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. I don't know about you. I can't go in afternoon. So 40 days. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. See, a lot of people don't realize that God has given authority of this world to Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. God has given him authority. Okay? So he took him to the, the highest mountain. And he said, I will give it all to you. He said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Listen to this. Then the devil went away. And the angels came and took care of Jesus. When we're confronted with something in this world, we can use the Bible as the tool to measure it. We can use the Bible as the tool to measure it. And we need to understand that this book is not a book of old made up stories. If you read it, you're going to find some crazy stuff in there, man. You think soap operas are crazy? Read about King David. It'll blow your mind. See, this book, believe it or not, is alive. It's alive. It is the very words of God. And it has the power to speak to us. Hebrews 4 
verses 12 through 13 say, the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. Joint and marrow. Y'all ever cut up a chicken? Yeah. Joint and marrow. That's a great analogy, isn't it? Told you it was cool. All right. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. If you think that you can hide from God, good luck with that. Let me tell you, it ain't going to work out. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. You know, it doesn't sound like a book of old made-up stories to me. Knowing that the Bible is God's written word to man should compel us to read every word that God has to say. It should compel us to do that. And if we do, when stuff comes up, we're going to know what God wants us to do in that situation. Listen to this. 2 Timothy 2.15. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. You know, when I became a Christian, I studied under the King James Version, and I really like the way it says it in the King James Version. Listen to this. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Study. You guys remember studying, right? Yeah, you know what that's like? You read it, right? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, knowing what's right and wrong. This verse explains that when we look in the Bible and we study it, we can know what's right and what's wrong. By studying our Bible, we can learn how we're supposed to live and act. But how do we know we can trust it? Well, listen to this. Thank you for asking. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. But I don't agree with what it says. You're wrong. Sorry. But I don't I don't agree. It doesn't change anything. I'm sorry. Almost sounds like this is a tool we can use, right? But how do I know it's true? Have you tried it? Let's go back to the tools. How do I know that any of these tools will work like they're supposed to? Because I've used them, right? In the past, I've had people say to me, listen to this. Yeah, Frankie, but you can't use verses from the Bible to validate that it's true. You can't use verses. That's like using false information to justify false information. It's a pretty good argument. If I didn't know any better, that might sway me a little bit. But let me tell you the issue with that. You ready? I've tried it. Listen, before I was a believer, I tried the world's logic. I tried to live like they wanted me to. I did the things they said would make you happy. I slept with all kinds of women, right? And then I got addicted to porn. How's that happen, right? I was divorced at 19. How does that happen? I'm following what you told me to do, right? That should make me happy. Then why wasn't I happy? Why was I so empty? I used all their logic and all their, their promises. And you know what, folks? It didn't work. And then one day, I've told you this before, I confessed the Lord Jesus. And I did it to get the fire insurance, okay? I did it to get fire insurance because I didn't want to go to hell, all right? 
And I'm like, hey, what's it going to hurt? So I went in the bathroom of a mobile station. True story. Locked the door. Got on my knees, prayed to God. Sincerely. And then I said, I got it. I'm good. I'm going to go live my life the way I was living it. Doesn't work. Because God's real. Okay? And I'm the one preaching now. I don't know what to tell you. But it's a book of made-up stories. No, it ain't. I'm here. I am doing this. I know it's real based on what's happened in my life. That's all I can tell you. But you don't believe it. I don't care. Good for you. Have a good day. Still can be friends. Okay? Look, if you use something over and over and over, and it works every time, you stop ignoring what other people say, don't you? Let me give you an example. Next slide. Yeah, I don't use Loctite, Frankie. Loctite's a waste of money. <laughs> you don't have to use Loctite. I will. Okay? Because I was riding down the road at 70 miles an hour and my head pipe came off. Loctite is important. Okay? How about this one? I don't buy the brand name drugs. Okay? Or excuse me, I always buy the brand name drug because the generics don't work as well. Folks, that's good for you. Spend more money, that's fine. Listen, I worked in a pharmaceutical manufacturing company. The brand name drug and the generic were made right next to each other with the same ingredients. But they work different. Okay, you spend your money. I'm going to do what I know, okay? Experience has taught me that those two statements are false. That's all there is to it. I'm going to do it anyway. But the Bible's so hard to understand, right? How do I use it as a tool? It's so hard. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. You ready? All right, here we go. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 3 through 5. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God. He and his companions broke the law by eating sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? Next slide. Matthew 19, 4. Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they recorded that from the very beginning. God made them male and female. We don't even know if that's true today, do we? Folks, come on. I am waiting for somebody to come on the news and say, I was just messing with you. Male and female, come on. Next slide. Matthew 21, 42. Then Jesus said, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stories that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Next slide. Matthew 22, 31. But now, as to whether or not there will be a resurrection of the dead, haven't you ever read about this in the scriptures? Listen, I'm pretty dense. Most of you already figured that out. Right? But I'm noticing a trend. Anybody else? God gave us the Bible so that we would read it. So that we would read it. But we don't as a people. That's the truth. We put it on a shelf so that when people come over the house, they know we're Christians. Right? I knew somebody put their lottery tickets in it. I was like, man, if that works for you. Tell me if that works. All right? For real. We don't read it. When we read the Bible and we allow it to have authority over our lives, we will unintentionally start to incorporate it into our everyday lives. We will start memorizing it. I never set out to memorize verses in the Bible, yet somehow they always come up. I never tried to memorize it. 
Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I think we said that before, didn't we? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, for this is your reasonable service. Folks, how's that happen? I was a porn addicted dude. I didn't look to say, man, let me memorize this. All you do is read it. It becomes part of who you are. And listen, it changes your life. It changes your life. And you know, when I got the fire insurance, I, I didn't believe it at all. It ain't gonna change my life. It ain't gonna change my life. You don't know who I am, right? You don't know how bad I am. You don't know what I do. Did I mention that I'm the one preaching? Listen, tonight's message was not a hard one. Read your Bible. Study it. Seek God's wisdom because ours sucks. You can quote me on that, all right? Use the Bible as a tool for your life. Listen, if you want a Bible, I got some. You can take the ones on your tables. We will buy more. There's no other book in history that's been printed more than the Bible. Look it up. No other book in history has come close to how many times the Bible's been printed. I'm sure that's a coincidence. There must be something special about it. And listen, the version that we'll give you is the New Living Translation. It's the reason I teach out of it is because it's extremely easy to understand. It doesn't have any of these thousand those in it, okay? Take time every day to read at least a chapter. It takes five minutes. Five minutes. We just don't have enough time. Well, then you need to stop doing something. All right? I guarantee you have time. You know how? Go to your switch where the panel is in the, in the garage and flip it off. I'm going to guarantee you have plenty of time. All right? Five minutes. If God's real, give him five minutes. What's it going to hurt? Even if it's all fake. <laughs> It ain't going to hurt you. This is one thing I'd rather be wrong about, amen? Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's an old saying that goes, this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. I don't want to read it. Gee, I wonder why. Right? I don't want to read how the stuff I'm doing is wrong. Listen, if you're here today and you've never read the Bible, that's okay. There's no judgment. But if there's any chance at all that it is God's word to man, then this is the most important book in history. Five minutes. Romans 3.23 says this. For everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person is a sinner, okay? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing with your heart that you are made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. 
Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Even the 25-year-old kid who got down on his knees in a mobile station bathroom called upon the name of the Lord. Folks, that's what it takes. I don't care if your daddy was a deacon. I don't care if your grandpa was a preacher. None of that matters. Your relationship with God is what matters. It's between you and God. That's it. When we come to the end of our life, there's only one person that could be the mediator, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you've never confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that that's the only thing you get from this message. After that, you start reading the book, and I promise you, life changes. Brian's going to play a few more verses, stanzas, or whatever you call it when you're a musician. And I'm going to be up here. If you need prayer, come on up. I'll pray with you. Scripture says, if two or more gather in my name, I am there amongst them. If you have a need, come on up as we play. that let's pray together father god we praise you so much lord we praise you for your word we thank you for how it teaches us we praise you that it can divide soul and spirit lord joint and marrow i pray that as we leave here we would recommit ourselves to reading your word and applying it to our lives especially this christmas season we love and praise you in jesus name amen I got three Bibles up here. Come get them. Y'all have a great night. Love you.